Okay, so I want to, I'm Eric Lane, I'm the Dean of Hofstra Law School, and I want to welcome all of you to this great event, and to thank all of you, both members of the Hofstra community and members of our next door neighbors, the bench, the bar of Nassau, Queens, Suffolk, uh, for coming to this event, this wonderful event today. And I also want to thank this wonderful collection of scholar advocates and essayists uh, to, who was willing to come here to discuss this extraordinary new book, How, you ca How Can You Represent These People? Um, a question I hope we will resolve once and for all after today, at least among some people. Um, also a special thanks to Abby Smith, the co-editor of this edition and essayist herself, and a, someone that really made the organization of this event really work well, and hopefully still will <laughs> by the time it's over. And Judith Black, somewhere here, thank you for all of your good work in putting this together. And I want to say to people in the audience, we were promised 180 chairs, but it turns out they don't have an 180 chairs. That's a disconnected promise, probably litigable. Um, and also, for those of you, we had a debate in the, amongst the administration about whether we could serve lunch today. In the dissent, Dean Gunlock said we should serve everybody lunch. I can't imagine. I, I'm of the theory that too much eating makes too little attention pain, so we chose against the lunch and it would make a mess and we'd have to pay for it. So no lunch, but hopefully, hopefully the wealth and richness of this discussion will at least push your hunger off for a couple hours. Now my special thanks for today, my special, special thanks since I already gave Abby my special thanks goes to my wonderful colleague of 37, maybe 38, I'm not sure, years now, Monroe Friedman. I remember, I've said this to some of you have heard this, some of you heard it too many times, but I remember 37 years ago in August being interviewed by the faculty of which there were only five or six at the time and then being told, now you have to go up to meet Monroe Friedman to see if he will hire you. And I walked into the office not knowing what to expect at all. I didn't even really remember what law school was like, let alone have any expectation about what it meant to be a law professor. They weren't teaching that at the time. Um, and I walked in and there he was sitting there and he looked at me and he sort of asked me a bunch of questions and I finally got to say to him, so what are your expectations of me? What would you like me to be doing um, in my first couple of years at the law school? And he said, do whatever you want as long as you make a difference. I don't think he meant to be a baseball player, <laughs> which I couldn't have been. Um, and as I thought about it then, and I hope I've lived up to that, but certainly Monroe Friedman has lived up to that banner. Professor Babcock? Certainly Monroe, more than anybody I ever met, has lived up to that. So just some examples. Alone, in the beginning, he rev has revolutionized the bench, bar, and academy with respect to the attention on ethics and the substance of what those ethics that are attended to ought to be. He alone helped elevate Warren Burger to the Supreme Court of the United States. <laughs> he did this by at some speech he gave, he suggested the possibility, he asked the question, what is a lawyer's, actually what is a public defender's uh, responsibility to an indigent defendant who is about to commit perjury in a criminal matter on the stand? He just simply asked the question. Monroe asking that question alone brought then circuit judge Warren Berger into a froth and chasing him and trying to get him disbarred along with some other judges 
Monroe's successful defense of that effort brought attention to Richard Nixon, who decided that, the, that um, Justice Berger, Judge Berger's cause was so noble, he appointed him as a consequence. <laughs> so Monroe, we owe you that as well. Uh, advertising for lawyers. Nobody is more responsible, at least foundationally, for the right of lawyers to advertise. And for Monroe, this was never an abstract question. This was a means by which poor people and low-income people would be able to know that they have rights that lawyers could be, that lawyers could defend for them. So advertising, he actually started advertising. I think he either brought an action or was sued for it. He prevailed. And eventually, he helped to convince the Justice Department that the Bar Association's bans on advertising for lawyers uh, violate the antitrust law. So that was an amazing thing. And most importantly for me in my career, and I talked to Dean Gunlock about this, and I think she would agree with this, most importantly is Monroe's commitment and exploration to the idea that when you decide to take on a client, you have made a moral decision that adds enormous responsibility to what you do as a lawyer. And I hope I would add to that, whether it be as a criminal defense lawyer, like most of you have been, or whether it has been as a prosecutor, or even closing on a house deal. You have made a moral decision which puts that decision and that responsibility in a special light. And Monroe, you have made me think about that question many, many times as I've, since I've been dean and I've traveled around talking about what it means to be a lawyer. And again today, Monroe here, all these years later, is still making a difference because it is through his great auspices that, and his keen insight and his good editing, if he did any of it, or Abby's keen editing, if he didn't, but he brought Abby in, uh, that we have today before us this wonderful panel of lawyers, advocates, and essayists to talk about this book, How You Can Represent These People. This is, I've actually read this book, so I can actually talk about it, but not much. So this is truly a really unique contribution to the uh, both lawyerly discourse on constitutional rights of people to be represented, but also on the public discourse, and probably now I was reading today in the New York Times about the head of the Federal Defender's Office in New York sending a letter to the judge to say we want to be able to represent uh, the Libyan that they have on board the ship. So I mean this quest and you know being held there. So this question remains just an extraordinary uh, question and of real relevance and at the heart of our constitutional promise of justice for all. So with that I'd like, it's my great pleasure, really my great pleasure, to introduce my dear colleague, my first dean, and my friend, Monroe Friedman. Oh. Uh, Eric, thank you for that very long introduction. <laughs> uh, and, and welcome, everyone. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dean Eric Lane for his graciousness, for his generosity, and for his unfailing support uh, that he's given uh, this book, but everything that I've done and, and what he has done for this law school. Um, I also would like to thank for their generous support, uh, Maurice Dean and Robert Gottlieb, and our stellar alumna, Celia Gordon, and other members of the Hofstra Law School community, uh, including particularly our special <laughs> director of special events, Judith Black, who dealt with every single detail, large and small. She's done a brilliant job. And uh, I want to note the presence of Keiichi Moroka, who came here. He is a criminal defense, <laughs> <laughs> cr 
criminal defense lawyer, did death penalty cases, and he's a professor of law, came here from Japan just to be at this conference. And I'm delighted to have been able to help Abby with this book, and also to be associated with the extraordinary people who have written chapters for the book, most of which you will be fortunate enough to hear today. <clears throat> now, we are talking about, about corporate law, so I, I think I should tell you something that I tell to my students, that when you get into practice, you will find that clients lie, clients cheat, clients kill other human beings out of pure greed. And if you have difficulty handling that, you have no business going into the practice of corporate law. <laughs> Well, that's not exactly true. But thank you so much to Dean Eric Lane and Hofstra University for your extraordinary generosity. This project has been a labor of love, mostly. <laughs> um, I couldn't be prouder of assembling these amazing contributing authors. I love and admire every single one. It's funny, every time I read or reread any essay in the book, I declare it's my favorite. I want to say a word about Monroe Friedman as well, my partner in crime, co-editor, co-author, mentor, one of my very best friends, really a part of my family. As usual, this book was his idea. It's a brilliant idea to put together a collection of thoughtful answers to what those of us in the business refer to as the cocktail party question, or more simply, the question. It's the question every criminal lawyer is asked at pretty much every social occasion, how can you represent those people? At 85, Monroe remains one of the most created, committed, courageous people I've ever known. I can't wait to hear his next idea. <laughs> so here's what we're gonna do. Each of us is going to read a very short excerpt from our essays, chapters. Um, no more than three minutes apiece in this order, followed by questions and answers from the audience. Okay, first is Barbara Babcock, and these are very, very short introductions. What? Oh, that's right, Celia and, and Bob are both speaking as well. Okay, thank you, perfect. Okay, in terms of the essay reading, though, we're gonna go in this order. Um, we're going to start with Barbara Babcock, who's a professor at Stanford Law School, former director of the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia, and author of Woman Lawyer, The Trials of Clara Foltz. Barbara will be followed by Tucker Carrington, the founding director of the Mississippi Innocence Project and professor of law at the University of Mississippi School of Law, former staff attorney for the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia, and former E. Barrett Prettyman Fellowship. Uh, program fellow at Georgetown Law School. Next will be Angela Davis, professor of law at American University, former director of the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia, author of Arbitrary Justice, The Power of the American Prosecutor. Then Monroe Friedman, who you all know and love, professor of law, former dean, Hofstra University, and recipient of the ABA's highest award for professionalism in recognition of a lifetime of original and influential scholarship in the field of lawyer's ethics. Then Vita Johnson, visiting professor of law at Georgetown University, former staff attorney at the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia, and former E. Barrett Prettyman Fellow. Then Ann Rohn, training director of the Colorado State Public Defender, faculty member of the National Criminal Defense College and the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers Death Penalty Voidir College. Then Megan Shapiro and William Montross, 
who co-authored a chapter. Megan's a staff attorney at the Louisiana Crisis Assistance Center, formerly with the Northern Virginia Capital Defenders. Uh, William is a senior capital attorney at the Southern Center for Human Rights, former Philadelphia public defender, Bronx defender, and New York appellate defender, as well as a former Prettyman Fellow. Then Robin Steinberg, founder and director of the Bronx Defenders, former deputy director of the Neighborhood Defender of Harlem, and former staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society in both Nassau County and New York City. Then Michael Tiger, professor of law at Duke and American University, author and editor of more than a dozen books and even a few plays, and of whom Justice Brennan once wrote, his tireless striving for justice stretches his arms toward perfection. Followed by Paul Butler, Georgetown University law professor, former federal prosecutor, author of Let's Get Free, A Hip-Hop Theory of Criminal Justice, and then me. So we have, I hadn't prepared Abby for this, but we actually added two speakers, uh, Bob Gottlieb and Celia Gordon, who are back there. Um, I don't have their whole resumes here, but I can tell you this, that they, Celia's our graduate, they have a wonderful law firm in which they handle extremely difficult cases uh, of the type that are being written about here today. Uh, recently, they represented the uh, subway bomber uh, who, and it was, they'll tell you, but it was a fascinating case for one reason, because the place he was going to place the bomb, had he been successful, would have destroyed their office. So they've been willing to come here and really tell you what it is to be a lawyer and also up right now in this kind of, um, um, this kind, with these kind of cases, raising this kind of question. And one last thing I forgot to mention, our sponsors, two of whom Monroe mentioned, but one of whom I didn't mention, which is uh, Bill Brewer. I don't know if any of you know him. He, Monroe told me he was called the Rambo of civil litigators. Is that true? Something like that. Anyway, he loves Monroe, so he sent a bunch of money for this event. <laughs> <laughs> and Okay, I'm sorry, Barbara. All right, uh, usually if I have only three minutes, I rehearse it, make sure, but I, I didn't get a chance to, but I'm gonna talk very fast, but very clearly. Uh, I, I once wrote an article on the 20th anniversary of Gideon 30 years ago about, uh, call, and I called it uh, sardonically, defending the guilty, because no matter where I am, people say, how can you defend someone when you know they're guilty? So here are the answers that I collected uh, for, um, use of anybody who wants to take up this work. The garbage collector's reason. Yes, it's dirty work, but someone must do it. The constitutionalist answer. It is noble work. The right to counsel is here invoked. And still best by Anthony Lewis, speaking of the dream of Gideon, of a vast, diverse country in which every person charged with crime will be capably defended no matter what his economic circumstances and in which the lawyer representing him will do so proudly without resentment. The civil libertarians answer, the criminally accused are the representatives of us all. When their rights are eroded, the camel's nose is under and the tent may collapse on anyone. In protecting the constitutional rights of criminal defendants, we are only protecting ourselves. The legal positivist answer, Truth cannot be known. Facts are indeterminate, contingent, and in criminal cases, often evanescent. A finding of guilt is not necessarily the truth, but instead a legal conclusion arrived after the role of the defense lawyer has been fully played. The sophist would add that it is not the duty of the defense lawyer to act as fact finder. Were she to handle a case according to her own assessment of guilt or innocence, she would be in the role of judge rather than advocate. The philosopher's answer, there's a difference between legal and moral guilt. The defense lawyer should not let her apprehension of moral guilt interfere with the analysis of legal guilt. The usual example is that of a person accused of murder who can respond with a claim of self-defense. The odds maker's answer, it's better that 10 guilty people go free than that one innocent is convicted. 
the political activist answer. Most people who commit crimes are themselves the victims of injustice. This statement is true generally when those accused, uh, since when those accused are oppressed minorities. It is also often true in the immediate case because the defendant has been battered and mistreated in the process of arrest and investigation. A lawyer performs good work when he helps to prevent the imprisonment of the poor, the outcast, and minorities in shameful conditions. The social worker's answer, this is akin to the political activist reason, but the emphasis is different. Those accused of crime as the most visible representatives of the disadvantaged underclass in America will actually be helped by having a defender, regardless of the actual outcome of their cases. Being treated as a real person in our society, almost by definition, if you have a lawyer, you're a real person. The, uh, and accorded the full panoply of rights and the measure of concern afforded by a lawyer can promote rehabilitation. The humanitarian's answer. The criminally accused are men and women in great need, and lawyers should come to their aid. As our icon, Clarence Darrow, says, with me representing people accused of crime was going to the foundation of motive and conduct and adjustments for human beings, instead of blindly talking of hatred and vengeance and that subtle indefinable quality that men call justice and of which nothing really is known. And last, the egotist answer. This is a large part of my own. Defending criminal cases is more interesting than the routine and repetitive work done by most lawyers, even those engaged in what passes for litigation in civil practice. <laughs> the heated facts of crime provide voyeuristic excitement. Actual court appearances, even jury trials, come earlier and more often in one's career than can be expected in any other area of the law. And winning, ah, winning, has great significance because the cards are stacked for the prosecutor. To win as an underdog and to win when the victory is clear, there's no appeal from a not guilty verdict, is sweet. All right, time passes more slowly in Mississippi, so this is three minutes Mississippi time. Um, <laughs> Ex I think I'm close though. Explaining how I can represent those people also makes me uncomfortable for other more substantive reasons. As posed, the question itself seems both presumptuous and too narrow at the same time. Presumptuous because it assumes that those people want and need our representation. I'm willing to concede that as an amorphous group, the underprivileged poor and beleaguered minority can use as much assistance as they can get, ours and others, but the less abstracted and more individualized they become, the more any assumption about a client's wants or needs runs afoul of much of what I think ought to be at the center of the attorney-client relationship, namely significant client autonomy. And it seems too narrow in as much as it gives short shrift to the possibility that those people may, in the course of representation, have something to offer themselves to us, their lawyers, and to the community at large. And so what is it precisely that they have to offer? Not money, surely, and not much in the way of other tangible effects either. That said, some of my most prized possessions are a hand-fashioned cross made from copper wire, a sculpture of a voluptuous nude woman carved from DC jail commissary soap, and from a disgruntled client whose trial I lost, a letter addressed to Tucker Carrington, attorney at flaw. Instead, what our clients can offer us is a way out of our solipsism. This path forward, so to speak, is an experience that I think all defenders have experienced to one degree or another. The most obvious example are the stories, the ones our clients tell us, the ones that they've lived. The problem, though, is that creating narrative is supposed to be our job, not our clients, or so we think. And mostly this is a good thing. We expend a lot of effort trying to tell this, our clients' stories to show that there's something other and more than the worst thing they may have done. But in that effort, I think we sometimes lose our way. Among the other things that get sacrificed is the truth, and sometimes the truth and the dignity that comes from hewing to it is all that's left to our clients. 
once when I was sitting in a courtroom in D.C. Superior Court where I watched this case after case was handled by a very kind judge. It was a misdemeanor calendar, so for the most part the offenses were fairly petty and nonviolent, simple drug possession, shoplifting, the daily grind in the district that few who live or work there are really aware of. But anyway, I, I was in this uh, ongoing saga where a young African-American male who'd been convicted was engaged in a conversation with the judge. Or more accurately, she was trying to engage him in a conversation that he was participating in only minimally, if that. I wasn't paying much attention at first. My thoughts were occupied by my own business there. But the hearing dragged on and I started paying attention. Evidently, the judge had told the defendant some weeks before that if he read a book uh, between the date of his conviction and the sentencing date and then report on that book to the court, she would look kindly and favorably upon his abilities to turn his life around, work hard in school, and be successful. So after much prodding, the judge got the young man to disclose that he had, in fact, been reading a book, but that he wasn't quite finished with it. She assured him that that was fine, that his good faith effort might be enough to get him an extension on his assignment, as long as he was willing to engage in some conversation with her about what he was reading and whether he liked it. What's the name of the book? She asked him. He couldn't remember. Uh, impatient, she asked if he could describe a bit of what it was about. Silence. Anything, the judge offered. It was about sports, he said, and the judge was cl clearly relieved. At last, you could almost hear her thinking, now we have something to work with. Do you like sports, she asked him. If silence counts as assent, then he enjoyed them a lot. <laughs> what was the book about specifically, she asked. Sports, he said. Yeah, but what about sports? How to play them? A certain team? Sports stars? Stars, he answered. And then to everyone's surprise, he offered up something else. Black sports stars. Pouncing on the opportunity. Life lessons. Role models. The judge perked up. That's terrific, she said. Who was profiled? Huh? <laughs> Named. Who were some of the black sports stars written about in the book? I can't remember, he said. You can't? Not even one, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, she offered. Silence. Anyone? Babe Ruth, he finally answered. <laughs> the most palpable reaction was the prosecutor. She was absolutely beside herself. As best I could tell, she viewed the defendant and his choices from the moment he had been arrested until this one as an exercise in thumbing his nose at authority. Her refusal to view the world on anything other than her own terms was to engage in a phrase from Professor Abby Smith in a kind of moral fascism. Not that anyone else was doing much better. The judge remained more or less implacable, but she was finished bending over backward. The defendant's lawyer was embarrassed. The spectators, mostly lawyers and court personnel, were stifling laughter. But everyone was missing the point and had been missing it all along. At some level, everyone was engaged in his or her own narrative charade. The prosecutor was engaged once again in an effort to lock up another of DC's young black males on behalf of the war on drugs. The judge, wiser by degrees, was doing her part to ease her conscience no matter what the result. The defense attorney, and I'd venture to guess most of us, were thinking that we'd been there, done that, hung out to dry in open court by a client's act of poor judgment. But everyone was missing the point, that is, except for the defendant. I'm convinced that he knew or knew as well as anyone could in his position precisely what he was doing. He was being honest, and in that effort, dragging the rest of us along with him as best he could. He was telling us about himself, about who he was, where he'd been, where he, were go where he was going, but none of us was listening very well. We were, in spite of ourselves and our reactions, in the presence of a certain kind of mastery, an individual's ability to tell us with absolute clarity an economy of word and gesture, a story, his story, and ours in relation to it of his young life. My name is Angela Davis, and my essay is called There But For the Grace of God Go I, which is my short answer to the question. From the moment I started at the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia, PDS, I knew it was where I was supposed to be. I spent the first six weeks of the job in an intensive training program along with six other lawyers learning everything from trial advocacy skills to developing a case theory to the ins and outs of the DC Superior Court. Charles Tree Ogletree was the training director for my class. 
Tree and the other lawyers at PDS made us feel as if we were soldiers in an army for justice. By the time the training program was over, I felt like the knight in shining armor on the PDS t-shirts, ready to charge across the street to court and slay anyone and everyone who came between my client and freedom. When I started at PDS in 1982, the first assignment for new lawyers was juvenile court. The juvenile client that had the greatest effect on me was my first, Albert Hicks, not his real name. Albert was charged with a misdemeanor, a simple assault in which he and two adults were alleged to have gone into the home of an acquaintance and beaten him up. My client said that he had not participated in the assault and had done nothing to help the adult co-defendants. I believed him. I investigated the case thoroughly and worked day and night preparing for trial. We went to trial before the Honorable Gladys Kessler, a tough but fair-minded judge. She found him involved, or guilty, seconds after I gave my closing argument. I was devastated. In hindsight, there was no logical reason for me to believe I could possibly obtain an acquittal for Albert. Acquittals by judges are rare, especially in juvenile cases, and our defense theory wasn't the strongest. But I was young and idealistic and maybe a little foolish. I had bonded with my client and wanted to free him from the juvenile justice system. With his record, there was a pretty good chance he would end up at Oak Hill, the juvenile facility. I couldn't help but feel that his conviction, called an adjudication of delinquency, was my failure. But it wasn't over. There was the disposition hearing, or sentencing hearing. I put all my energy in getting to the best possible result for Albert. I had my work cut out for me. Albert had a juvenile record a mile long, and I found out that he had been charged as an adult for an armed robbery in nearby Prince George's County, Maryland, where, amazingly, he had received a probationary sentence. For some reason, none of this got in the way of my believing Albert's story. In juvenile court, in order to sentence a child, the judge must find that the child committed a delinquent act and that he is in need of care and rehabilitation. If the judge is convinced that the child does not need care and rehabilitation, she may dismiss the case for social reasons. If she finds that he is in need of care and rehabilitation, she may either place him on probation or commit him to the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, DYRS. I decided on an unconventional strategy for the disposition hearing. There was no way Judge Kessler was going to put my client on probation in view of his juvenile and adult record records. I decided to file a motion to dismiss for social reasons. This was unusual because these motions were ordinarily filed in cases where the juvenile was a first offender and there was lots of evidence that he was ordinarily a well-behaved, exceptional kid. There would be letters from teachers, pastors, and community members praising the child for his good grades and good works. There was no such evidence in support of dismissal for Albert. Instead, my motion suggested the opposite. I argued that because Albert has such a long juvenile record and now even an adult record, there was really nothing the juvenile justice system could do for him. <laughs> His adult probation would be revoked in Prince George's County, so why send him for a period of incarceration at Oak Hill where he couldn't be helped anyway? Not surprisingly, Judge Kessler didn't buy it. <laughs> she committed him to DYRS for a period of two years, the maximum sentence he could get. Again, I was devastated more so than after the trial. There was nothing else I could do for Albert. I tried so hard to get a good result for him, yet I failed him at every step of the process. I told Albert that I was sorry and that I would come to Oak Hill to see him soon. I held it together long enough to make it out of the courtroom. I ran to the restroom where I burst into tears. What kind of lawyer was I anyway? That poor kid relied on me and this was the best I could do. The door of the restroom opened and Mrs. Hicks, Albert's mother, walked in. She came over, hugged me and said, Miss Davis, don't worry about Albert, he'll be all right. She wasn't crying. I thought, something is wrong with this picture. <laughs> I should be comforting her, I need to get it together. But I really liked this kid. I didn't care that he had a long record of criminal behavior and had done a lot of bad things. He wasn't a bad person. He was smart and talented and gentle and kind, despite his criminal behavior. There was no excuse for his behavior, but there was definitely an explanation. Albert's family was poor. He'd never known his father, and almost every adult around him was involved in the criminal justice system. As smart as he was, the D.C. public school system had failed him. 
Albert's mother did the best she could, but she was a single mother with several other children. Albert had no positive mentors and knew no life other than the one he had. Even though I grew up relatively poor, I'd had so many more opportunities. I had parents who were not educated, but who had high standards for their children and worked hard to send us to good schools. I grew up in a racist, segregated town, but I had good role models who instilled in me the value of education as the great equalizer. I had strict parents who made me behave, and I had a big sister who rescued me from the police. That's another part of the essay. <laughs> Albert had none of these things. There but for the grace of God go I. No idea exactly how being Jewish has influenced my commitment to, civil, to human rights. I can say only that it's impossible for me to separate being a Jew from the way I feel about these issues. I don't mean to imply that any of the values I have absorbed as a Jew are not shared by other faiths or even that all Jews would agree with my understanding of these values. I mean to say only that these are my values and that they have influenced my role as a criminal defense lawyer. Every client, no matter what he has been accused of doing or has in fact done, is a fellow human being who is suffering. To recognize this is to invoke Rachmanit, or compassion, despite the fact that the suffering may be that, own, that, that person's own fault. According to Jewish tradition, compassion is one of the seven pillars on which God created the world, and it is worthy of emulation. The biblical Abraham is, for me, a criminal lawyer, defense lawyer's role model. When God intended to destroy the people of Saddam and Gomorrah, Abraham confronted the ultimate judge with a question. Wilt thou indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Then, even more audaciously, he demanded, shall not the judge of all the earth do justly? Step by step, Abraham then persuaded God to spare the city for the stake of 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, and then 10 people. Of particular note, Abraham's plea was on behalf of non-Jews, on behalf of people who were strangers to him, all fellow human beings for whom he felt compassion, despite what the Torah calls their exceeding grievous sinfulness. In addition to the accused, <clears throat> there may well be one or more family members, human beings who are also suffering. Has, uh, here's a memory that has stayed for me for over half a century. I went to the DC jail to meet with a client. It was cold and snowing. Outside the heavy wooden door of the fortress-like building, huddled against the red stone of the building, was a boy about eight years old, alone, shivering, and with tears and mucus running down his face. Apparently, a member of his family 
was visiting another relative or friend in the jail. That boy was in effect a collateral victim of whatever his relative had done or was accused of having done. He was inevitably part of the reason I was at the jail that day. As the great criminal defense lawyer Clarence Darrow said, in criminal law, you are dealing with flesh, blood, reputations, shame, disgrace, and honor, but also with wives, fathers, mothers, and children. These are the things that have drawn me to be a criminal defense lawyer and to represent those who are referred to disparagingly as those people. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for having me. I'm just delighted to be here and included among these amazing lawyers. I'm going to read from the very beginning of my chapter and then I'm going to go a few um, pages ahead. But if you want to know what comes in between, you guys will have to read the book. Late one fall night in 1967, a group of men placed a bomb under the floor of a parsonage connected to St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Laurel, Mississippi. The men then moved a safe distance away and lit the fuse. The bomb exploded, and the kitchen and dining area were blown apart. That parsonage was the home of my maternal grandparents. My grandfather, Dr. Revelyn Allen Johnson, was the pastor of St. Paul's United Methodist. When the bomb exploded, he, my grandmother, and three of their children were asleep. Miraculously, the bedrooms where they were sleeping were not seriously damaged, and no one was hurt. My grandfather and his family were targeted because they were African American and because my grandfather was a leader in the civil rights movement. He was active in the NAACP and was a member of the Voters League. My grandparents, however, did not waver in the face of violence. Indeed, the morning after the bombing, my grandmother sent her young children to school so that everyone would know that the Johnson family was not intimidated. The policies of mass incarceration and overcriminalization of the African American community threatened so much of what my grandparents and their colleagues fought for the right to vote, equal representation in government, and equal employment opportunity. While not overtly based on race, the racialized enforcement of our criminal justice policies lead to the same result. Employers may not explicitly refuse employment on the basis of race. Instead, they use criminal records as a basis for denying or ending employment. Like Jim Crow, our current criminal justice regime virtually ensures that black Americans will have higher rates of unemployment and poverty, fewer and worse educational opportunities, and underrepresentation in democratic institutions. Disturbingly, and yet perhaps not coincidentally, this process of mass incarceration and criminalization began in the mid-1970s when the civil rights movement had begun to accomplish so many of its objectives. When I enter a courtroom to represent an indigent defendant, I'm fighting against the same double standards, the same inequities, and the same unfairness that my grandparents fought against. The battle remains the same, only the battlefield has changed. In fact, the subject, the subject of, this very, of this book, How Can You Represent Those People, highlights one very significant way in which the battlefield has changed. Unequal treatment based on criminalization rather than race has eliminated the moral authority of those who would fight against this unequal treatment. Where blatant discrimination based on race is now more morally repugnant to most Americans, this is not so for unequal treatment of people who have been charged or convicted of crimes. Indeed, most Americans seem to believe that people with criminal records should be denied rights and opportunities. Efforts to garner public support for change through boycotts, marches, or protests are unlikely to succeed. There are, however, ways to fight for some measure of equality. One of them is to make sure that when police and prosecutors try to convict a person of a crime or put him in prison, 
that person has a lawyer who will use every legal means to stop them, or at least hold them to the very high burden of proof required in criminal cases. To me, the question is not how can I represent those people, but how can I not? So I like a good fight, as long as it's a fair one. And I like fighting for poor people accused of crime and knowing that the harder and smarter I work, the fairer that fight gets. I'm a public defender because I love my country and the promise our Constitution extends to every person in this country who's accused of a crime, that when you walk into court, you don't have to stand alone. I started out public defending in Pueblo, Colorado, which is just 70 miles north of the site of the Ludlow Massacre. It was an early 20th century showdown between striking miners and the National Guard at the behest of the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. The miners had set up this tent city to protest corporate control of the mines, and between 19 and 25 of them were murdered on April the 20th, 1914, including two women and 11 little children who were burned to death as they huddled in a hole that had been dug beneath the tents to save them. It was the culminating act of perhaps the most violent struggle between corporate power and laboring men in American history. A couple of years later, Woody Guthrie wrote a song about that day from the perspective of one of the surviving miners. I will never forget the look on the faces of the men and the women that awful day when we stood around to preach their funeral and laid the corpses of the dead away. We told the Colorado governor to call the president, told him to call off his National Guard. But the National Guard belonged to the governor, so he didn't try so very hard. That history is woven into the fabric of Southern Colorado, and it makes it an amazing place to learn how to defend the poor. I found that juries there were appropriately skeptical of law enforcement, that judges, for the most part, exercised their power with care, and that prosecutors, for the most part, understood and responded to the community that they served. CF and I was in the process of scaling back operations, and they were laying people off all over the place when I got down there. But the mill and the rhythms of shift work were still a big part of that town's identity. And so too was Ludlow's lesson, that collusion between the government and commerce against working people is deadly. But even in a place sensitized to the abuse of official power, because of its history, people would ask me, how can you represent those people? And even my clients would ask me a version of that question. And the question that clients ask you when they want to ask you that question is this, when are you going to be a real lawyer? <laughs> and they meant it. They, they meant a private lawyer who charged a lot of money and had a really nice office. And they meant it as a compliment. But maybe my client's question was closer to that other ubiquitous question than I thought. Maybe by real lawyer, they meant a lawyer who had the luxury of choosing her clients. My clients, as I said, meant their question as a compliment. They thought that I was good enough to be a, a private lawyer for rich people. The implication that only rich people should get good lawyers didn't seem to register with them. And likewise, those who asked me how I can represent those people seemed primarily motivated by a belief that lawyers with other, more comfortable options than what I do for a living should grab them. Well, how about this answer to that question? Just please help me understand who you think those people are. Because from what I've seen, it could have been me, or it could have been you, and it might be your kids, and it might be my kids down the road if things break bad. I've been asked this question a lot over the years, and you know, it used to infuriate me. I saw it as this thoughtless dismissal of my entire professional identity. But looking back, I've become convinced that most of the time, it was me bringing animosity into the conversation. It's true that there are some people who ask that question as a deliberate provocation, kind of crowding the plate. And when that happens, I don't have any problem at all with throwing the ball as hard as I can right at their head. <laughs> but I have come to realize that, by and large, people are just curious. When I can respond to the generalized those people with a story about a specific client that I keep anonymous because of ethics, Monroe, <laughs> the, question <laughs> the question can lead to a thoughtful exchange instead of a caustic one. 
And I'll admit I don't always have the patience to be thoughtful. Sometimes when people say, how can you represent these people, I just say, because I'm really pro-crime. <laughs> But I'm lucky to do work that I love, and I'm lucky to be able to fight for people who truly need me. And I talk about luck a lot because my experience doing this for 25 years has really made me believe that luck is all that separates me from my clients. Helping someone turn bad luck around by making sure the Constitution works as it's supposed to, no matter how destitute or reviled or just damaged my client may be, is my way of serving my country. That's how I represent those people, because those people are us.